Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day you're watching this, we welcome you to Oasis Online. My name's Nate, I'm the pastor here at Oasis, and I just wanted to jump online here for just a second to uh, communicate and give you a heads up on some changes that we're making in our online experience. See, we believe that this journey with Christ is not meant to be done in isolation, that we are to be in community together um, in this journey with Jesus. And so we're shifting our online experience just a little bit um, to encourage you and to challenge you to go get plugged into a local church. This online experience should be a supplement, a, a in addition to you being connected with and serving with and loving uh, together in a church community in your local context. Um, so wherever you find yourself, if you find yourself in, a Mead, in the Meadville area, go get connected with the church. If that's Oasis, that's awesome. We meet at 836 North Main Street, 930 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Come hang out with us. If you're not ready for our large group gathering, we have house churches where you can get connected. And you can find out information online or you can shoot me a message. Go to our website or go to our Facebook page. Shoot me a message and we'll get you connected with any of those expressions of church that we have in this area. If you're outside this area of Meadville, I want to encourage you with all that I am <laughs> to go get connected to a local church body. So come alongside. You have gifts and talents that God has uniquely designed for you. He has good works for you to do, and it's to be done in the local church context. And your gifts and talents are to be used and for the benefit of other believers. And we can't do that when we're in isolation, watching church online by ourselves at home. And so we want to encourage you to go get connected in your local church expression. Whatever church that would be, we want to encourage you to go get connected and plugged in. So thanks for joining us. Um, things are going to look a little bit different. There's not going to be a worship time. It's just boiled down to prayer and teaching. And again, this, we pray, is supplemental to you being connected in a local church body. All right, so thanks for joining us. Uh, we look forward to all that God is going to do in and through the ministries here at Oasis, but also through you as you get connected in your local church, in your area, and in your context. Hey guys, my name is Joel and I'm part of the team here at Oasis and I'm so glad that you could join us uh, for worship today. Before uh, Nate opens up the word with us, we're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer. And over the last couple weeks, we've been going through this sermon series called Apprenticeship, A Picture of Holiness. And it's been really, really good. And there's been a couple things that have been particularly uh, convicting for me because as we uh, want to live this life of apprenticeship, of just deeper discipleship, of knowing God in a deeper way and following his footsteps, being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus and doing what he did. Uh, one of the things that has been highlighted for me is, is just the extent to which um, we're distracted. We're distracted by all these other things uh, that the world is, is offering, by, by entertainment and by uh, pursuing career and wealth and, and reputation and, and just comfort and relaxation and, and fun stuff, you know, living, quote unquote, the good life without without recognizing that that the real good life is is apprenticeship to Jesus. That's what the real good life is. And so um, I wanted to to open up this time of prayer with this uh, this passage of scripture. 1 John 2 verse 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life 
is not from the Father, but it's, it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Uh, that's a challenging scripture. Uh, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So all this good stuff that God created, you can't love it and love God at the same time. We can appreciate it. We can, we can enjoy it and thank God for those things. But the extent to which we have loved it, it's distracting us from our relationship with God. Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. It's physically impossible. And so as you think about your week, as you think about what you're doing day in and day, day out, would your life look like you were serving God as, as your master? Or would it really look like you're serving your job, your workplace, your children, your family, um, the, the different things you do with your family, the, 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 the entertainment, the, the luxuries you enjoy, all those things? Are you serving those or are you serving God? And that's a challenging word. And I'm going to be honest. Like, like I want to come from a place of humility. Like, I don't have this figured out. This has been challenging for me. And so, um, yeah, I just, I just think it'd be important for us to spend some time in prayer um, because it's not easy to, to, to figure out how to be in the world, but not of the world. Like, we're called to be ambassadors of light to the world. So we're, we're not supposed to, to leave today. You know, we're not supposed to just float up to heaven or something. No, no, we're here. And this is a good thing, uh, but we can't be of the world. We can't be um, defined by the desires of the flesh and eyes and, and the pride of life. So what does that look like? Um, I think that's going to take wisdom and it's, it's going to take time for us to continually give our desires and our loves over to Jesus um, and ask him to come and transform us. And so, um, again, I don't know what that looks like, which is why we need to pray, because God does. And so um, let's spend some time in prayer. Let's, uh, I'm going to pray real quick. And then wherever you are, if you're at the Oasis building, if you are at one of our house churches or watching along with your family, wherever you are, spend some time in prayer. Uh, maybe quietly to God by yourself or just out loud with those around you. And then Nate's going to close this in prayer. So let's pray. Father in heaven, you're just so good and kind and gracious and loving and so powerful. You're high and lifted up. And um, we're never going to be able to fully comprehend your might and your, your goodness and your greatness. But would you just give us more and more of a glimpse of that, God? And I, I pray that as we see you more clearly, that the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life and all those things that are distracting us, I pray that, that slowly our, our affection, our, our care, our attention to those things would, would dim and would fade away and that we would see you. We would see you clearly and we would want desire out of our deepest. It wouldn't just be some discipline where we have to grit our teeth and push through but you would change our desires, change our loves and our longings so that we would, we would want to follow you. We would want to be with you, become like you. and We want to do what you did, God. I, I just, just That's what we want to do. So um, I just pray that you would work that miracle by your Holy Spirit. And would you give us wisdom as we navigate how to figure this out, how, how to balance this being in the world but not of the world, whatever that looks like. We need your Holy Spirit to be guiding us. We need your word to be guiding us. So, so would you just help us to become a people that's shaped and guided by your word and by your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would do that miracle in our hearts to just change us from the inside out. Help us to devote more and more of our lives to you. We love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Father God, we thank you for this time that we can spend together in prayer and in digging into your word together. I pray that you would just open our hearts now to your teaching. Help us to not just be listeners to your word today, but to put these truths into practice in our lives so that we can experience the life that you intended for us to experience and to live. So we love you and we give you this time to you in your name we pray. Amen. Welcome again to Oasis Online. We're excited you're here. And just a reminder, this teaching is supplemental to you getting connected and being in community. But I just want to say the weather around here has been pretty, uh, I don't know if I would say spectacular, but pretty amazing. We've not had this kind of snow for a long, long time. And it's been um, work to keep things cleared uh, but hopefully you get out and get to enjoy some of the beauty of what's going on out there, the chill in the air and the sunshine we're going to have this week. But I want to ask you, how are you all doing with this series? Um, it's been pretty intense. Are you really wrestling with what it means to be an apprentice to Jesus? So in being an apprentice, we want to orient our lives around these kind of three goals. One is to be with Jesus. The next is to become like him, and the third is to do what he did. And last week we talked about that end goal of an apprentice is to become like your teacher and do what they do. And in John 14, 12, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. So what did Jesus do? And we talked about that last week. He preached the gospel. He taught the way. He healed the sick. He casted out demons. He ate and drank with people far from God. He did justice. He participated in peacemaking. He prophesied and he stood up against religious and political corruption. Even raised people from the dead. That one didn't make it on the list, did it? So Jesus, you're telling me as an apprentice, as I follow you, as I spend time with you and become like you, I'm going to do the same things that you did. That is pretty incredible. What do you do with that verse? How do you feel about what you've experienced as a follower of Jesus up to this point? For me, it means something's got to change. Um, I don't know how long you've been going to church or how long you've been a follower of Jesus, and maybe you haven't yet. And I would encourage you to take that step first to put your trust in him as Lord and Savior. But I've been going to church my entire 45-year life. I've been going to church. And some of those things on that list are happening. Sure, here I am. I'm teaching. I'm showing and teaching people um, how to do the way. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching. I'm Uh, I've ate and drank with people who are far from God. I've participated in peacemaking and justice. But I wouldn't say they're greater than what Jesus did. I would say I'm participating but not experiencing that kind of life that Jesus did or maybe that he expects or has designed me for. Um, So there's this challenge that Something has to change in order for me to be this apprentice to Jesus that he desires for me to be. And and so I have to change and change is hard. But let's just be honest for a minute. The church has not done a really good job in uh, pointing us to this kind of apprenticeship. Um, yes, uh, like we would, we would say it's more like, yes, there's a God and I, I turn to him when I need him and, and I want him to make my life better. And it's kind of like self-help and self-improvement and I'm not knocking the church. I'm just saying that's kind of how we've been raised or maybe taught in dealing with scripture and going to Bible studies our, our whole life just to, to make ourselves feel better or uh, does I don't even know why some people go to Bible studies 
I'm not knocking the church, don't get me wrong, but that's just kind of how things are and the way we treat scripture and the stories in scripture and the lessons in teachers just kind of to make us a better person, a nice guy. But we're created in the image of God and there's this gap between what we were designed to be and who we currently are. And to be an apprentice means I want to close that gap. I know where I am and I'm beginning to learn where God wants me to be and being an apprentice to Jesus, I'm going to start closing that gap from where I am to where Jesus wants me to be and has designed me to be. So let's work on closing that gap. So so how do we do that? Well, we've talked about we want to design our lives around those three goals of being with Jesus, of becoming like Jesus, and third, than doing what Jesus did, right? It's all about transformation. It's about arranging our lives around the goal of transformation to become like Jesus. But I would say that most followers of Jesus are stuck or they're content to say, okay, this is close enough to what Jesus was, and I'm just going to stay here. I, I, I don't want to become fully like him, and I don't want to do all the things that he did. I'm just content to, to miss out on this life to the full, and I'm just going to pause right here. And This feels pretty comfortable. But the truth is, every day you're being formed or transformed into something or someone. The question is who... And what are you being formed into? And so what we're suggesting is that you intentionally design your life and your day around getting to where God wants you to be and where he created you to be, which is becoming more like Jesus. So how do we change? Today, we're going to talk about teaching and we're going to talk about practicing. We're going to talk about teaching and practicing. So if you want to grab your Bible and turn with me to Mark chapter 1, we're going to read verses 14 through 15, and we read from the NLT version. So in verse 14, it says, Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee, where he preached the good news, God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sin and believe the good news. Now, there's a lot of teaching from Jesus, but if you boil it all down, it kind of all points to this idea. The central theme of Jesus' teaching is right here in talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near. And the, the, the central part of his message is the kingdom of God. And the second part is to repent and believe. Repent means to change your mind. To change your mind or your thought life, to redream what your life would be like if it was centered around the kingdom of God, to reimagine life, your life, centered around the kingdom of God, is the first step of transformation. And me and my teaching, as we spend time together in teaching and you listening and putting into practice what we're talking about, but the the idea behind teaching is to capture your imagination. It's aimed at your mind, and we want to capture your imagination and, and show you a better picture of what it means to live this life. Teaching, when it's done well, gives you an alternative vision of life to the full. Advertising everything about your life. Advertising, the things you watch on TV, the radio, everything is designed and, and tells you what they think is the best life or what it means to live life to the full. And teaching tells you and shows you what those lies are and what is not true and what is true and how to experience the best life. All right, let's... Turn back to scripture and jump with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. In Romans 12, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. 
This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of, of the world. Don't believe all those lies and the commercials and, and advertising and all the stuff that you hear that say this is the good life. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. The first step Paul is talking about here to transformation is the renewing of your mind, a continual renewing of the mind and, and a thinking, replacing destructive ideas with life-giving ideas centered on Jesus and the kingdom of God. There is so much in our mind that is not constructive. There are destructive ideas that we live by every day. And transformation of the mind means that we're replacing those destructive ideas with life-giving ideas centered on Jesus and his kingdom. And this takes time, this teach, takes teaching, and this takes practice in the context of community. Now, John Mark Comer goes into this lengthy discussion about um, how our minds are designed and wired um, one of these things is called neuroplasticity, meaning your thoughts, the thoughts that you have or neurons that fire in your mind in a certain way over time create a pattern that become easily, more easily followed the more times you make that decision or more time, the more times that that idea is fired in your mind. Now I can get all scientific and uh, explain what all of that means, but I, I just want to talk to you about that's why we can remember things. Like when I first, I, I found this killer uh, sweet roll recipe. And I, I, like a, I like a good sweet roll. And uh, this one that I make is kind of a biscuit base and it is so good, so yummy. And um, my wife kind of perfected it and wrote down some different things on this recipe. And then I've been making it and oh, they're so, so good. But I've made them so many times that I, I pull out the recipe, but I don't really look at the recipe because I've traveled in my mind. I, I've traveled that path so many times that I just know how to get there. I know how to get to the destination. I know how to make these sweet rolls. <clears throat> Same thing with lo mein. Like lo mein, I found a recipe and I made lo mein and, and I've made it so many times. Actually, the recipe, I can't find it anymore. Um, online, so it's in my mind, and I can just make it because I know the path, I know how to get there. But when I make a cheesecake, I got to look at the recipe because I don't do that very often. So I got to look at the recipe because I haven't cut that path as many times, and it's harder for me to get there. And so I have to look at a recipe. Our brains make paths to get to certain places and the more times we travel that path it becomes natural and we don't even have to think about it. Think about our minds like this massive jungle. This massive massive jungle and in our minds there's this little person, this little tiny person that has a machete and they're cutting paths to different destinations. They're, they're going to all these different places. And, and the first time I made these sweet rolls, a path was cut with the machete to get to that end destination of deliciousness. The next time I traveled to get there, the path was already cut. And so maybe I just had to knock down a few uh, saplings that were starting to come up, but I got there and it was easier to get there. The third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, that path was worn down and I could see it clearly and I just kind of got there without even really thinking about it. Our brains make paths to get in certain places and the more times we travel that path, it becomes more natural and we don't even think about it. That's, that's why I can remember how to drive here to church. That's why I can remember my wife's name and why I can re most of the time remember my kids' names. Maybe not call them the right name, but I can at least remember the names of my three kids and their birthdays. And, but 
That's why it's also, so that's a good thing, but it's also a destructive thing because many times we get stuck in destructive patterns that are harmful and we continue to go down that path because we know how to get there and it just becomes a natural part for what we do. But the idea here is that we can rewire and retrain our brain. We can practice and we can cut new paths with time and teaching is part of that training. Putting teaching into practice cuts new paths. Reading your Bible, reading a good book, sitting under teaching, podcast, getting a mentor, someone to speak truth into your life, getting teaching into your mind is the first step of transformation. But a lot of people get stuck right there with just the teaching. And they don't go any further. And the truth is, is we can't think our way to becoming like Jesus. We can't just think, make me like Jesus. We can't just think about being like Jesus and all of a sudden we become like Jesus. That's not how it works. Wouldn't that be awesome if it was? How many of you on a Sunday morning or through this teaching, at the end we always have a what now? And on Sunday morning, you're like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put it into practice. And then Monday comes and you've totally forgotten about it. And then next Sunday, we kind of circle back around in the series and we talk about the what now from the previous week. And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even do anything. You had the best of intention, but you totally forgot all about it. The truth is, is what we love in our hearts is far greater and has a far greater influence on what we do than what we know in our heads. You know the what now that we talked about at the end of our teaching is a good thing. But what you love in your heart um, doesn't allow your brain to do what you know is right because you love these things. Knowledge isn't the problem. We know what is right. We know what is wrong. The problem is, is that what we love has a far greater influence on what we do than the knowledge that we have in our head. Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 and 27 kind of, it talks about this. Um, so this comes at the end of Jesus's probably most popular sermon. Um, and teaching, uh, this collection of teaching in Matthew 7, verse 24, it says this, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't but collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish. Like a person who builds his house on sand. When it rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus follows his teaching with these words. Do it and your house will stand. Do what I teach and your house will stand. And if you don't, Jesus says, then your house will collapse. Those who practice will remain when hard times come. They will be able to stand against the rain, the floodwaters, and the wind. And those who don't will crumble. This scripture makes me think about so many situations that I've run into over the many years in ministry that I've been a part of. Um, situations where families or individuals have hit some really hard times. Maybe it's financially, maybe it's with a death in the family or terminal illness or loss of a job or whatever. And they've been able to handle it with strength and with grace. Um, and it's their relationship with Jesus kind of shines through and it's such an encouragement. But then on the other side of that, I've seen families and individuals who have gone to church their entire lives and gone to Bible studies their entire lives. And as soon as a hard time hits, their lives just crumble. And I'm not talking about just their relationship with Jesus. I'm talking about their marriage crumbles, their, their finances crumble, their uh, other relationships. They just fall apart. They call themselves Christians, but they're not really practicing the way. They're not practicing the teaching that they had been hearing. 
John 13 says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. And that's Jesus speaking. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done for you. And in James 1, 22, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself. You walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free and do what it says, you will be blessed. Teaching has to lead to practice. Teaching has to lead to practice. It's got to. It's got to lead to practice. Practicing does something to us. The things we do do something to us. Practicing counters our habits. We are the product of our habits. Your habits are doing something to you. For better or for worse, they're turning you into someone. And teaching is aimed at your mind and your thinking. And practice gets to your heart and to your loves. The problem isn't that we love. The problem is that we love a lot of the wrong things. You see, discipleship is about pointing our loves and our longings toward the right things and in the right direction. We are so prone to wonder. We are so prone to think, this is the good life. This is the good life. This is the good life. No, this is the good life. There are so many ideas about out there of what the good life is and what is the best thing for your life. And those are typically based on sex, sex, sexuality, or materialism. Those are the two biggest things. But there are so many out there in advertising and the media and so many other people tell you what those things are and what you should follow. But I'm telling you, Jesus has an idea. Jesus has an idea about life, and he has an idea about life to the full, and it's based on the kingdom of God. Practice is key. More than knowing what's true, we have to want what's true. Think about shopping. A lot of you go shopping. I go shopping. I, I like to go shopping. I don't go shopping a whole lot, but when I do, it's, it's fun. And the truth about shopping is uh, most of us go shopping for stuff and we would say, um, well, media would tell us that the more stuff you buy when you're shopping, the happier you'll be. Buy this brand and you'll be happy. Buy this thing and you'll be full of joy and it will give your life meaning. Wear this and you're going to impress somebody. And, and the truth is about shopping and so many other things, the more we shop, the more we want to shop. We want more of that thing. We say we don't believe it, but most of us live by this idea of more stuff equals more happiness. The more we shop, the more we want to shop. The more we eat, the more we want to eat. The more we watch Netflix, the more we want to watch Netflix. The more we download porn, the more we want to download porn. It just It's a natural part of how we're wired. The things we do, like I said before, then do something to us. When we give in to those urges, the more, the more, the more, that does something to us. What you do, what you repeat, the habits of your life, what you do does something to your heart. The what now is kind of an assignment. It's an assignment um, that has to deal with your habits. So I want to encourage you to write out your habits. What are the consistent things that you do every day? What are your habits from morning when you wake up to work, to noon, to kids, to whatever? What are your habits through the day? And write them out. Now, here's the, here's the shift. So we're not going to talk about are they sinful, are they not sinful? We're not going to even go there. I just want you to look at that habit. And think about and process, what is that habit doing to me? What is that hour of Netflix doing to me? What is, whatever it is, 
What is that hour on social media? What is it doing to me? What is this eating habit doing to me? What is this a uh, relationship habit doing to me. What, whatever it is, what is this habit doing to me? Make a connection of what that habit is doing to your heart. And then here's another challenge. As you recognize a habit in your life that is doing something that is damaging to your heart, replace it. Replace it with a practice of prayer, of silence, of solitude, of reading your Bible, um, whatever it is, replace it with a discipline, a spiritual discipline that would help center your heart and help it turn towards loving something else that maybe is a little more, more healthy for you in your life. So that's the challenge. Write out your habits and for a season, replace that habit with a practice of Jesus. Prayer, solitude, worship, Bible reading, and then journal. Do this for a week. Do it for two weeks. Do it for a month. And then come back and reevaluate your heart. What has this habit done to your heart? This is the direction we're headed as a church, this practicing the way of Jesus. And you can't experience a life, a full life, a life in the fullest without practicing. You can't become great at anything by just reading or uh, by looking at a, watching, a, listening to a podcast or reading a magazine. You can't become great at that thing. A lot of you are hunters. And you can't become a great hunter by just reading and watching other people go on hunting trips and watching other people set traps or what out. You can't become a good hunter. At some point, you got to get out into the woods and you got to practice what you're reading, practice what you're watching, practice what you're listening to. You got to put it into practice. You got to get out into the woods. And you can't experience life to the full. You can't become like Jesus just by listening to me teach and reading a daily devotional. You can't become more like Jesus by just watching a, a cool movie about Jesus. You can't become like Jesus by just reading your Bible and then closing it and walking away. You have to practice. At some point, you have to put those things into practice. And as the, you put those things into practice, then they become a habit for you. And they become life-giving for you. And they transform your heart and your loves. And you become like Jesus. And you do the things that he did. It's beautiful. So I want to encourage you. Write down your habits. Pick one habit and replace it with a practice of Jesus. Prayer, solitude, worship, Bible reading, whatever it is, whatever gives you life, do it. And then see what happens for a period of time, week, two weeks, a month. Try it out. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for this time we could spend together. We love you. We just pray that you would continue to encourage us to trust you, that you have a better way of living for every single one of us. Help us not to believe the lies and help us this week to have the courage to evaluate our habits, evaluate what they're doing to our hearts. And God, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would reveal to us the damage that is being done by some of the habits that we believe are good for us. God, we love you. And we just look forward to what's going to come as we put these things into practice this week. In your name we pray. Amen.